Welcome to Gen Z Deep Dive. I'm your host, Aaron Brown, and we are brought to you by the Institute for Generational Dynamics, which focuses on Gen Z and millennials in the workplace, but also the challenges that baby boomers and Gen X face communicating with younger generations. Uh, today we're going to talk about the fact that Gen Z loves the show Friends. Uh, Gen X loves the show Friends on Netflix. It's been streaming for a few years now. Gen X is the largest, uh, they are the largest streamer of the show. Uh, but Marta Kaufman, the show Friends co-creator, was interviewed at the Tribeca Film Festival on the heels of the show's 25th anniversary. Can you believe it's been that long since Friends came out? Kaufman told the story of how her 20-year-old daughter didn't even know her mother created the show. Kaufman's daughter, daughter and her friends love Friends. Uh, and as many of you remember, the show went to Netflix a few years ago, as we mentioned. Uh, when Gen Z high schoolers saw the show, they thought it was a period piece. In essence, Gen Z thought the show was made now in the 21st century, 2018, 2019, but took place in the 1990s. When Friends came out in 1994, the first Gen Zers were just buns in the oven. As many of you know, Gen Z birth years began in 1995. So Gen Z may have assumed Friends was a period piece, but Gen Z lacks the insight of what the show meant to Gen X, to their parents. Gen Z's parents are Gen X, so they kind of lack the perspective of why was this show so fun and engaging and entertaining for Gen X, uh, who, as I mentioned, are the largest streamers of the show. Uh, furthermore, to get into a few generational dynamics, millennials analyze the show through today's politically correct lens, and they analyze it through a lens of intersectionality. Often, millennials see the show as homophobic, too white or Caucasian, and out of touch with economic stressors. What I think is really interesting is that Gen Z finds the show unrealistic. Gen Z, when they watch the show, they ask these questions. Why isn't there more focus on the careers of the characters? They seem to live these great lives and we don't understand how or why they're successful. And these kinds of questions, they provide insight into how the mind of Gen Z works. Essentially, Gen Z expects, to some degree, for television to provide keys to success. Boomers, Gen X, and cusper millennials like myself would simply mock the show for being unrealistic, but enjoy the escape from reality the show is meant to elicit. If you're creating media for Gen Z, don't focus on helping Gen Z escape. As much as you're connecting them to your media, you want them to perceive that the, that the media is believable. And this is interesting given that Gen Z has grown up on a steady diet of dystopic media, like the Hunger Games, uh, which is a little bit of a millennial cusper thing, the Divergent series. Yes, that's it, the Divergent series. Um, and so make sure that you're connecting them to believable points. They need to believe and be able to see that characters are living out these believable lives, whereas the rest of us just want to escape uh, from the doldrums of incessant 24-hour news cycles. Uh, for some, the show is sexually, and for some, the show is sexually charged. But it also begs the question. Why would Gen Z think Friends is a period piece? Maybe it's due to a lack of technology in the show. Uh, the characters Ross, Joey, Chandler, uh, none of them meet via social media apps. They all just are friends and they meet organically. Um, the, the only exception would be for Ross answering a printed 
roommate ad in a newspaper? Who even puts ads in the newspaper anymore? Instead of casually meeting each other and then friending each other on Facebook, which is a millennial habit, or following each other on Instagram, these individuals meet through real life connections and interactions, things that don't really happen outside of the high school experience for Gen Z. Now, remember, Friends is really a Gen X product for Gen Xers. It contains elements of the Gen X ethos. If you want to be successful, you have to work hard. Life sucks, but it's also fun. You have to figure out life with the help of your friends. There's hope and everything will work out in the end. The content of Friends is different in contrast to the material Gen X puts out for Gen Z now. Again, the world tends to be a little dystopic. Uh, it's not hopeful like Harry Potter. And don't take risks like the cast of Friends, whether it be for career or for romance. And this is really interesting because we're also seeing shows on HBO, and the name of that show is Escaping Me. But we're also seeing shows that talk about the sexualization of Gen Z and it's trying to be portrayed as real life and in reality, uh, sex outside of marriage and teenage birth rates are down compared to previous years. They're down with Gen Z. So it's interesting how the media is approaching marketing to Gen Z and maybe even not listening uh, to what it is that Gen Z really wants. They want to see shows of people and understand how they're being successful in their careers because Gen Z to some degree feels like they live in an uncertain world and very much want a roadmap to success for their lives. So Friends, a period piece, is just a little too unrealistic for Gen Z to buy into. Now we're gonna switch gears a little bit and we are going to talk about how Gen Z is killing football. The Morning Consult reported that football just isn't making touchdowns with Gen Z. We had to get a pun in there somewhere. And specifically, about 7 out of 10 adults prefer the National Football League over, ma over Major League Baseball, while only 1 out of 2 Gen Z uh, prefer the NFL over the MLB. About 1 out of 10 Gen Z enjoy Major League Soccer, and the MLB. About two out of five Gen Z say the NFL is their favorite league. So what's the reason for the NFL's loss of down, sorry we had to get another one in there, with Gen Z? Bob Cook, a contributor to Forbes Lifestyle section, reports that every year for the past 10 years, football declines by 1% to 3%. Those who are familiar with the game of football uh, we'll take notice with these nerdy statistics. 11-player football participation, or the football we enjoy at most high school levels and collegiate, is down by 6.5% from 10 years ago. To make that statistic a little more real, in 2009, there were 14,226 schools that participated in 11-man football. Nine years later, by 2018, there were 14,079 schools participating in 11-man football. That's a loss of yards, pun intended, of 147 schools. Losing 147 schools in 10 years, or about 14 schools per year, doesn't seem like a big deal. Uh, what that number does affect and brings into starker perspective is that in 10 years, there are 72,436 high school age boys who didn't play football. If we average that number out over 10 years, about 7,200 fewer boys played football each year. And there's tons of reasons for, for the decline of Gen Z participating in football. However, at the Institute for Generational Dynamics, we go back to our favorite question for Gen Z. And that favorite question is, am I safe? Am I safe? 
One major reason for the decrease in Gen Z playing football is the risk of head injuries. We just saw in the news, if you are a football fan, Antonio Brown arguing and petitioning about his helmet while he was in sort of in spring practice with the Raiders. And the league denied, saying, no, you can't use your old helmet. It's not up to snuff to protect your noodle. So, no, you have to use a new helmet that is going that is engineered to protect your head from head injuries. And the NFL is taking great strides to make their players safer from concussions. Uh, and the NFL has spent recent years in legal battles and losing on the issues of concussions. High schools have also made bigger strides while companies have emerged with tech to more quickly diagnose a concussion on the field. So it seems that parents want their Gen, off, Gen Z offspring safe from concussions. And Gen Z wants to be safe from concussions and physical harm. Now, some would rightfully say there are other factors that affect Gen Z's lack of participation in football. You're right. Rural America continues to shrink. And as it shrinks, our cities become more populated, more crowded, the suburbs increase. So with this shrinkage in rural communities, there aren't enough kids to play 11-man football. Furthermore, charter and magnet schools are pulling kids away from traditional public schools where football is supported. But I think it's key to notice that charter and magnet schools either don't have the resources to support and compete in football, and parents and students just don't seem to care. Perhaps there is a shift in our expectations of what school is for, the telos, the end result, the end goal, and due to the increased demands of parents and Gen Zers for safety. Uh, an education is just more preferable to playing sports, and specifically in our case, football. So I grew up in rural Oklahoma where sports could be alive. Peers would transfer to different schools uh, based on the quality of athletic programs, not on the quality of the education they hoped to, perceive, hoped to receive. Finally, a couple of other reasons, mostly due to technology, may explain the may explain the decline in participation and viewership of football. Uh, the rise of professional video game players and watching YouTube personalities play video games online may explain the decrease. Other sports like lacrosse are growing in popularity with less risk of injury compared to football. Gen Z is also not watching TV in the traditional sense instead consuming their content via streaming services, which lends itself to decline in viewership. This is evidence in the fact the median age of television and football viewership rose to age 50, up from the median age of 44. That means that the NFL's demographic is growing older and not picking up younger viewers. On the other hand, games like soccer, which don't take commercial breaks, now have an advantage for Gen Z viewers who grew up stream with streaming services and few commercials. Even, co even college football stadium attendance is decreasing. Will stadiums that host football one day become mausoleums of the sport? Or will we see numbers grow to watch professional video gamers play their games, lacrosse compete in front of crowds of 50,000, or play host to emerging sports like CrossFit. At the end of the day, it appears that Gen Z has little interest in physically harmful sports that they perceive are dangerous, and it seems that there are other sports and activities that are more in line and more adjacent or akin to technology. Finally, switching gears, and we will have a show here in a few weeks, a, a longer show, an emphasis on Gen Z and college. This will be something that we constantly touch on throughout uh, the Gen Z deep dive experience that you're listening to right now. 
And the question is, does a college degree matter to Gen Z? Uh, according, to Harvard Business, according to Harvard Business Review, college is very expensive, but we didn't need Harvard to tell us that. The average college grad walks away with a minimum $30,000 in student loans. But that's not the only problem. Only one out of two students actually complete their, a degree. Furthermore, two out of five of those students that do graduate are actually underemployed. Unfortunately, if you start out underemployed, you are highly likely to remain underemployed for the foreseeable future. So what's part of the solution? How can we overcome these obstacles? One is digital skills. But universities, despite the bells and whistles they teach with or thought would draw students to them, don't necessarily keep up with digital skills. According to the World Economic Forum, approximately three out of 10 organizations think their org is properly staffed with digital talent. The Business Roundtable, the Association of Business CEOs, claim they can't fill positions in their organizations that require STEM backgrounds. They just don't have enough people with STEM backgrounds. If you're not familiar with STEM, it's an acronym for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. Eight out of 10 CEOs, or four out of five CEOs, they don't know if their organization can handle the digital skills gap. Uh, since millennials communicate dissatisfaction with their quality of life, Gen Z is paying close attention to their millennial predecessors. Uh, home ownership is down. Business creation is down. And Gen Z is asking the question, do I need a college degree to start life or just to start out in life? And there is a reality that if you are in the Gen Z demographic, maybe you shouldn't go to college. Maybe you should go to trade school. There's plenty of plumbers and electricians and tradesmen who are pulling in at least six figures a year. There's many who are millionaires and they're living that millionaire next door lifestyle. If you're Gen X or millennial, uh, you recognize that reference to the millionaire next door, but they are living fantastic lives and comfortable lives. They're working hard, there's no doubt about that. Uh, but they are living uh, safer economic lives because they have a skill set which is always in demand. I live out here in beautiful Colorado Springs, Colorado, and tradespeople are backed up. You have to schedule a tradesperson weeks, maybe months out to get a home built or to come and fix something that's wrong at your home. So if you're Gen Z or if you've got a Gen Z son or daughter, you may, it may do you well to direct them into the trades. Uh, what if Gen Z only needs a good first job? A good digital skills related job may be great, um, but make sure that's in a winning sector of the economy. So we want to, if you're Gen Z, you want to make sure that if you're getting into these digital skills, go to a school that actually has a digital skills program. Or can you go to something like a full cell university? If not a full cell university, what can you do online that will get you trained uh, to apply for these various jobs in the digital skills economy. Well, I'm Aaron Brown. Thank you so much for being with us on the podcast for this week, and we will catch you later.